Hello, everyone. This is Jessica Pettit. And who do I have the pleasure of interviewing today? Mike Damish, and I'm excited to be here with you, Jessica. So I'm the founder of the Center for Respect, and I travel the world working with school systems and universities and military installations and corporations and associations of all sizes on creating a culture of respect, culture of both respect and consent, depending on who we're working with. And, and for me, this is a very personal mission. Uh, going back 30 years ago, I was a college student. I received a phone call that my sister Sherry, now Sherry was the youngest of my sisters, and all my sisters are older than me, but Sherry was the youngest of those older sisters. I received a phone call from my mom that Sherry had been raped. I was enraged, I was furious, I was confused, I was lost, I was hurt, and I didn't know what to do with myself. And over the next few months, I would struggle. I would transfer universities because I wanted to be close to home. And in this case, the predator was caught and there was a trial. And so I started looking at the law and I started seeing what is, what is this person up for? What is sexual assault legally? And then it said consent. And I had to look at myself in the mirror and go, consent means it, by the definition of it, it sounds like you almost need to ask, even though it doesn't say that. It looks like, and I thought I was really naive at the time. So I thought, hmm, I haven't done much. So maybe it's just me, but I'll ask my friends. And I'm like, do you ask? And they're like, no one ask. And I'd be like, men, women, all genders. Like, do you ask? They're like, no one ask. And I'm like, oh my gosh. We have a culture that's built on people just doing things to people until someone stops them. And that was where I had the revelation of, I don't want that for myself. I don't want that for anybody. And I heard a speaker and I went to that speaker and I said, I want to do this. And he said, you show up at my door, I'll share whatever I've got. And I showed up and he said, no one ever shows up and you showed up. So he gave me everything he had. And I went back to my local high school and asked a teacher. Uh, uh, Judy Farrell, uh, Mrs. Farrell, I said, uh, can I do this program? And she said, yes. And when I was done, she said, this is what you should be doing. And that's mm -hmm. where it all began. That was 1990-91. Wow. That's amazing. Well, I also would like to disclose that, Mike, you are actually a very good friend of mine, not to mention someone that I look up to professionally, but uh, it's, it is wonderful to be able to get to do this with someone that I think we are mutually on each other's speed dial. When we're out doing this work, it is exhausting and can often be too much and can rub us the wrong way and can be exhilarating. And sometimes that's all in the same hour. Um, so I'm really wonder, I'm glad you're here and I'm honored that you're here and I appreciate the work that you're doing. Well, thank you, Jessica. Look, it was my love for you that made me instantly react to this request. When I saw you put it out to the world, I thought, oh my gosh, that sounds awesome. And it's Jessica. So how could it not be awesome? So thank <laughs> you for all that because the love and respect is mutual. Well, I'm trying to accept compliments better. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, You're welcome. Interesting transition is I ask really hard questions, or at least that's what people say. So the first two are big ideas that are rumbling around in my head. We have not talked about this in a previous phone call. Um, there's no wrong answers, but through your lens and your work and just your life, I'm really curious to see how different all these answers end up being. So the first uh, big idea is diversity dividend. The concept usually comes up in conversations with me about return on investment of doing a training that might fall under diversity and inclusion or equity work, or in this case, I think your respect-based work, that is not a soft skill. And I bet you probably have to explain what the ROI is. So when thinking about investment, action, and return, what does diversity dividend mean to you? Yeah, I think it's a powerful statement, diversity dividend. So I, I think it's a really cool question to ask. So thank you. I think what it, what it means for me is what's the long-term outcome of when you create a culture of respect? And what that means is that you have everybody feeling more appreciated, more valued. And if I feel appreciated and valued, I want to be at work. I want to help you solve problems. I want to bring you my best. And therefore, productivity soars. And the research shows this, uh, not only productivity, but their well-being, their loyalty to the company, which means profits now soar because problem solving goes up. Harvard Business Review actually did a study on what's the number one thing that impacts all these different components of an employee. And respect was by far the number one answer. And strangely enough, over 50% of the employees surveyed out of thousands 
over 50% said they did not feel respected by their leadership. Mm. So imagine how that's devastating organizations. And inclusivity and diversity is a big part of this because how can I feel respected if I don't feel that I'm being seen for who I am, for how mm. I bring myself to this world, if I'm being ignored? Or, and so we really have to have these conversations to bring everybody into the conversation because the more we have diversity in our answers, the more creative our problem solving is. Mm -hmm. The more unique answers we hear that we might have never have considered as an organization that makes us stronger, the more we can bring more people to organization, customers and clients, because they see an organization that cares about everybody and it's reflected in the problems that you solve, the way you solve them, because diversity is built in there. Versus mm -hmm. the old way, which is this small group solves a problem and they come back to the big group and go, here's the problem solved. And people go, well, I'm not really into selling that problem because the solution, I wasn't part of it. Mm -hmm. And when you come from a place that I want to hear everybody in diversity and inclusion, everybody's part of the solution. Now I'm excited about the solution. I want to sell the solution. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is the other big kind of idea rolling around up here is kind of the flip of exactly what you're talking about, sort of, and that is asterisks, other duties assigned. So sometimes this is the last line of a job description. Sometimes it's stuff that we do so that we can feel like we have a community inside of a place where we might not have a culture of respect. What does asterisks, other duties assigned mean to you? Well, to me, it's dangerous. I work with a lot of organizations where the people that I work with are asterisks, you know, duties assigned on very serious topics. And so what happens is, I'll give you an example. I can work in an environment where somebody's asterisk duties assigned is to deal with sexual assault in that culture. And it's a major problem in that culture. And it's an asterisk duty assigned. Right. Right. So they're actually the bookkeeper or accountant and also their Title IX officer. What? Yeah. Yes, right. yes. And so, and then they go, but we prioritize this problem. Well, clearly you don't. So part of what we're discussing, Jessica, is that organizations have to have a wake-up call of what they, when they use the word priority, understanding its definition. Because mm -hmm. you cannot say something is a priority and then put it to the side. That's a complete hypocrisy when you do that. And so one of the things we have to do is help organizations recognize how they're failing to prioritize respect in the organization. And it's very common that it happens and they don't recognize it. And when you help them recognize it, they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even catch that. Like for instance, people say to me, oh well, yeah, I want everybody to feel respected. It doesn't show up anywhere in your list of core values. Mm -hmm. The word doesn't even show up. Words related to it don't show up. So if it's not showing up in your core values, how can I believe you care deeply about it as an organization? And I would say to connect to other duties assigned, if, you're, if it's not a budget line item, then the other duties assigned is usually not financially rewarded. So you can't prioritize something you're not paying for, just like you can't actually hold anybody accountable to a value you haven't stated. That yeah, I'll give you a great example of that is an organization who says, oh yeah, we believe in a culture of respect. And I say, great, uh, what events have you done? And they'll tell me about their big annual events or their conferences. And I'll say, great, what speakers have you brought about that? What do you mean? We've never had a speaker on that. Well, then every time your people come together to learn, you've never made this a topic of priority. How can, it, how can they possibly be, feel like you care about their being valued, them being appreciated? And it might have been a breakout session at most, mm -hmm. but you didn't bring it from the front of the stage where they got to hear you say, hey, here's what we believe in. And here's how we're gonna do this every day. Here's how we're going to make you walk in and feel valued. I'm going to give you skills to do it because that's one of the biggest mistakes is that we talk about this from up here, from the cloud level, but we're not talking that on the ground level. What do I need to do every day to look you in the eyes and, and understand you? I'll give you a classic example people don't think about when right. it comes to triggering people, all right? And corporations don't have that discussion. They don't discuss triggers typically. Mm -hmm you're more likely to see that discussion in a university environment, an educational environment. And I'll say to companies, do you know what triggers those you lead? And management would be like, what do you mean triggers? 
you know, upsets them, offends them, hurts them. Like if I know what hurts those I lead, I can do everything I can to avoid doing that and triggering them in the first place. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, how can I know all their triggers? How about you ask? Yeah. Conversation. Yeah. yeah. Why don't yeah. you say what are things I could do or do or other leaders have done that, that could trigger you? Cause I don't want to do that. I want to create the safest environment for you to be productive. And if you're comfortable, what you're comfortable sharing with me, I want you to know you can tell me that because I don't want to do that again if I've already done it. And even if I haven't and others have done it, I don't want to be a repeat of past offenses. Mm -hmm. So I want to learn the most about you to be the best supporter of your work. Well, and that's a, a that beautiful, way it's so caring. It's a beautiful Venn diagram of what I know of you as a person and all of your work historically, right? Is that if we can engage in a conversation and ask the questions, we can be respectful and caring. Like Exactly. Like people ask me, the way that works beautifully is that people say, Mike, you come from a consent discussion background. That's where you were in colleges and military. Now you do it in corporate. How does that, like, how does that even apply in the corporate world? Well, this is just it. Consent's about asking questions mm -hmm. and respecting the answers. Mm -hmm. So if I'm willing to ask you a question and do it in a respectful way and honor your answer, now you know that you're valued. Even when, it's, when I talk consent with a kiss and you say, well, what does it feel like to be asked? People in the audience will be like, oh, it feels so good to know I have a choice and my choice is valued and honored. How is that any different in the workplace when you're working on a project to feel like you have a choice in your role in this project and where it's going to drive and where it's going to go and that your choice will be honored and valued? It's right. incredibly powerful. That is wonderful. I've, I've been such a fan of your work over the years and i feel like our kind of mutual admiration club the idea of being able to engage in a conversation that you don't know if the other person is interested in is ultimately the self-reflection that's needed to be able to create an honoring and respectful place can you talk a little bit about your work and the creating a culture of respect um, the, the movement, I think, is probably the most appropriate way to describe what you do <laughs> inside of any kind of environment, whether it's corporate or association or military, all these things that you do. Can you talk a little bit about what you do do? Yeah, what we do is we hold up a mirror to the audience and say, I ask a simple question that the audience can easily identify with and answer. And by them answering that, it allows us to drive the conversation to fit that audience's needs. Mm -hmm. Because most people in an organization do not feel that they disrespect people. They don't believe that. They don't believe they engage in behaviors that are disrespectful or degrading. So if I can simply ask a question that they can all easily answer, I'll give you an example. If it was, if it was consent we were talking about, right? I could walk in any atmosphere and say, hey, before someone kisses someone, could be a spouse, could be a first date, could be a hookup. Do most people ask or go for it? Well, the whole room yells, go for it. Okay. Later on, I'll say, does everybody deserve a choice before you do something with their body sexually or intimately? The whole room yells, yes. And I go, well, then why don't you give your partner choices? You told me earlier, you just go for it. Well, they can't get mad at me because mm -hmm. they gave those answers. So what they do is they're going, oh my gosh, I do do that. Mm -hmm. Why do I do that? Now they're in a self-reflective moment of, I don't want to do that anymore. Right. What are my new options for moving forward? And they're, now they're excited to get the skills. Like now I can teach them, oh, here's what you do. So same thing with companies. We'll come in and ask questions like, I'll say to people, hey, remember the first time you moved in with someone? How long did it take you to tick them off? <laughs> or, or how long did it take for you to get annoyed by something they were doing, right? And I'll even bring somebody up on stage and say, do you remember that day? And they're like, oh, what, 30 seconds? You know, they'll, they'll, they'll come up and everybody's laughing, having fun going, yes, yeah, so we've all done this, whether intentional or not. Mm -hmm. We've all done this. So let's now be intentional about trying to not do harm and create a wonderful supportive environment that's intentional with skills we can all apply. Does that well, help answer? Absolutely. And I think that what I would add is you live your message, right? So by literally getting your audiences to want the skills, you as the speaker or the trainer, the consultant, now here they are because you have actually gotten them to ask for the information. Instead of you starting with, here are all the skills that you're doing wrong, 
oftentimes that can land really bad, especially in like a DNI kind of power dynamic space because they haven't even consented to being learned, right? Oh, it's, it's ugly. I mean, because I'm on a topic nobody wants to admit. Nobody wants to say, I lack the skills to be respectful. Nobody wants to admit that. So when I'm walking in the room, people aren't going, oh, great, this is the one I need. If I'm walking in the room, they're going, if anything, they're doing, oh, why do I have to be here? I don't need this. Or they're doing, oh, I know someone who needs this. Mm -hmm. But it's never themselves. Right. So there's a wall up immediately when I walk in the room. If I had come in and said what you just described, Jessica, oh, here's what we notice everybody's doing wrong. The wall's now just getting reinforced. They do not want to hear this. Versus I walk in and go, hey, is this true? And everybody yells, yes, the wall's down. Because the moment everyone in the room yells, yes, they all feel they're on the same page. Now it's safe. Right. Now it's not confrontational. And by me allowing them to answer and honoring their answer, which is what you said, living the message, I can only drive the program based on their answer. Right. So I cannot have a preconceived notion or agenda here because that would be manipulating and not listening. Mm -hmm. And I've got to be willing to listen and drive where it needs to go. Absolutely. I totally agree. Um, are you ready for my two favorite questions? <laughs> I am. First favorite question is, what is something you have changed your mind about lately? Ooh, that's a great question. What is something that has shifted my mind lately? I read something recently that I thought was really powerful. And that is, it was about death and life. And, and I'm a big believer that if you're going to teach respectfulness and create a culture, you have to be very mindful, uh, very mindful. And it was this idea that to live each day, like it may be our last day, we could die at any time. And I thought that I was like, no, because that's saying I'm going to die. And there's a negative to that. And shifting the mindset of I'm going to die, like we're all going to die. And so to treasure the day instead of live like today, like I'm going to die. No, live like today because I'm going to treasure every day. And, and I want everybody to treasure their days. So how I treat people every day matters because that could be the last day I see them or they see me. And so it helped shift to a comfort zone of really treasuring that and honoring that versus pushing back from, I don't like that because it involves this end game of death <laughs> versus this end game of death is why I want to treasure the day turning right. it to a positive. And that's true of respecting people too. I don't want to do harm to you when I may never get to see you again or, or fix that harm. And by the way, even if I do see you again, you might not let me fix that because I already did the harm. Mm -hmm. And that's your choice. And I don't get to say whether you, I get to fix that or not because that's your life. And right. I caused it. I don't want to do that. Great. What do you absolutely know? <laughs> that every human being deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. You know, when you first said that, Jessica, I laughed. You saw it because I thought, I don't know, is there anything I truly know? Because I, I think we have to be open to us being wrong. But that little statement I made right there, that every human being deserves to be treated with a basic level of dignity and respect, to me is a no-brainer. I, I think that's, we have to live on that principle because if we don't, then you have to prove your worthiness to me. You know, the old statement, you, gotta, you have to earn respect. Well, that means you get to judge whether I'm worthy or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to feel that from you, by the way, if you are treating me that way, which means now there's a lack of respect both ways. How about we just all treat each other with dignity and respect? It will show in every aspect of life if we do. Yeah, I, a, a place that I'm doing my own self-work on now is I have often limited the autonomy or the agency of dignity and respect to and between humans. And uh, one of the things that I'm attempting to practice and it's amazing how default my mechanisms are to privilege humans but if i treat all things all elements with dignity and respect the habit can form and so it's not just between humans that i agree with or humans i disagree with or humans i don't know and humans i do know but what does dignity and respect really mean when i'm thinking about trees i'm thinking about butterfly forests i'm thinking about the lake behind you i'm thinking about the planet that we are on communities i will never meet people who are not born yet can i do the work of dignity and respect of all of the things that i come in contact with um, i'm gonna go with probably 
do I consistently do it? Probably not. But that is some uh, self-work I'm doing now. So thank you. Well, for it's the- beautiful because mm-hmm. one, it's true. If you live it everywhere, it's easier to live it with human beings, right? I mean, that's just so, so true. And mm-hmm. there are certain spiritual belief systems out there that are very profoundly based in that, that mm-hmm. are based in this idea that we are one with the earth and that all things deserve this versus humans deserve this. So thank you for sharing that. Really powerful. Yeah, well, what kind of made me go there was the the humans having to prove their worth in order to deserve dignity and respect um, is that the use of land producing food, then the land has value, but it doesn't, something doesn't have to have value to be in service to someone else. Correct. Right? That, that was the connection. So I love that. Okay. I just be our presence alone is of value. Right. One would think, right? Right. Um, so, lightning round. This is hard to switch to lightning round because now I'm thinking like an outlet mall has a value, but the land that the outlet mall is sitting on has a value and a history connected to other people, not connected to the outlet mall. Welcome to my brain and <laughs> to regular conversations between Mike and I. I was just going to say, this is not unusual. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lightning round. So, uh, icebreaker questions you picked three numbers you lucked out and got four six and seven all of which are easy questions so number four is name the group where you felt the happiest most integrated and most accepted wow um i would say it's my colleagues within the national speakers association when i'm there it's like family it's like home there's a close second right now but but I want to keep it to one. And some of those brothers and sisters in my life are the people I call first in the most difficult and the most celebratory moments. And that's grown out of the family environment of the National Speaker Association. For me, that's it. That's amazing. Number six is name the most beautiful place to which you've been. Oh, wow. I love to travel. I mean, you know this. So, um, and, and sometimes I've, the most beautiful spots are surprises. I didn't go there thinking it was be the most beautiful spot. But I think I'm going to go with a simpler answer. I like to go out on this little lake behind me every morning I can, if weather allows, and be on a kayak, and I'll be the only one on the lake. Maybe there'll be a fisherman out on some corner of the lake fishing. But, and just, it might be 5 a.m. and the sun's not up yet. And that to me is the most beautiful place in the world. It's a place of serenity, of peace, of quiet. Mm -hmm. And you feel like you're alone, even though within a hundred yards, there's homes in every direction probably, Uh, but it doesn't feel that way. And so for me, that's a true place of beauty where I can be in other beautiful places, but if my family's not there with me, there's something missing. Like I wish I was sharing this with someone. Uh, And I've been in, I've been fortunate to be in, I was just in Croatia and their national parks are one of the most beautiful places just visually I've ever seen. But there's a difference in visual beauty and inner beauty also where it takes our soul to also. And I'm just saying the whole package for me, it's that. It's in that kayak in the morning hours. What's well, amazing because I know you so well. So I knew what questions you asked. You only gave me numbers. And because <laughs> right. I know you and this house and that lake, I assumed that would be your answer. And then how magical that number seven that you randomly picked is about by the way these aren't these weren't random i mean these numbers that i actually thought about like why i picked those well it's not the random of the numbers but it's the random of the numbers connected to a question you don't correct correct so i almost pretty much guaranteed that number six was going to be the lake behind your house um (laughs) so what's amazing about that is because you travel so much so number seven is if you're given six thousand dollars to plan your next vacation where would you go and what would you do where I go, I wouldn't worry about um, just anywhere where I'd have my family with me. So I'd be looking at what I can do with $6,000 to get all of my, my family together and be there together and explore together. I love creating experiences that create a house for others. And ironically, I had to look at this self-reflectively years ago and like, what's my unique ability? And it should show up in every element of my life. And mine does. What I just said is what I love to do on stage. And it's what I love to do when I plan a vacation. I love to plan something where I get to watch those I love go, wow, or, ah, or just have those moments. That for me is a high. Just, and it's not that anybody turns around and goes, oh, you plan this. No, it's me watching them have the experience. And just, I love that. I love mm-hmm. that exploration. So it would be anywhere that would allow my family to have that with me. 
That's wonderful. I was just in Reno, Nevada, of all places, and I was looking around, uh, I was being taken around to look at different sculptures that are actually coming from Burning Man, and um, I've never been to Burning Man, and these sculptures are some of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And the uh, client and her husband were giving me a tour of all of them, and I was taking photographs and just a gape at this, specifically this giant veil that lights up, and it's just amazing. Some of the most beautiful art I've ever seen, and it's just in Reno, Nevada. I would not have guessed that. But what was the coolest part of the evening that you just touched on was watching the two of them watch an out-of-towner fall in love with the place that they live in, <laughs> and... Uh, I wish upon people the ability to live in a place where they get to watch other people fall in love with where they live, which again, full circle brings me back to your home. Thank you very much for having me over, inviting me to that lake and being home for me. And if people wanted to get in touch with you and do work with you, how would they get in touch with you? Because they're not as lucky as me and they don't get you. <laughs> well, you know, you're always welcome out here. Absolutely. For everybody watching, I would be thrilled for you to reach out to me. Our website is centerforrespect.com. If you're an Instagram person, I'm instagram.com slash Mike Respects. So Mike Respects, that's my Instagram tag. But our main website, centerforrespect.com. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking soon. <laughs> thank you, Jessica. Thank you for this opportunity. This has been awesome.